Only quite recently, nutrition has become a more publicly debated subject in the context of agriculture and development. Nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive approaches that look at the right kind of cropping mix to achieve better nutritional outcomes, for example, are entering the discussions. Lawrence, in conjunction with the Global Conference on Nutrition in November, your team launched the Global Nutrition Report. Since then, you've been speaking about its key findings at many occasions. From the interactions you had so far, where do you see the main difference between what you had found most important in the report and what people find worth asking you about? I think the thing that people were most surprised about was the uh, benefit-cost ratios from scaling up nutrition interventions. So we did this for 40 countries, and the benefit-to-cost ratio was 16 to 1 uh, at the median of these 40 countries. And people, when I put that slide up, people in the audience were, I could hear a gasp from them. Um, some of them were disbelieving, actually. Uh, and then I explained the methodology behind it, and it was very rigorous and econometric and uh, you know, they're published in top-rated journals, and then they began to believe. And then the other issue come, comes into play of, well, can we afford to wait 25 years for these benefits to start flowing when we have to front up the costs immediately? When you look at the Twitter uh, reports after a talk, that's the one slide that people have taken a photo of and they, they're, they're tweeting about. Why do you think is that particular number so important? I think a lot of people think of nutrition as a health issue, not as an economic issue, not as an issue about uh, it's a good investment compared to investing in a road or investing in a port or investing in agriculture R&D. I think most people think it's a very soft sort of nebulous concept, but these estimates show that you get very hard returns. And the other thing I, I said was, you know, this 16 to 1 ratio over a 30-year time period, it's like investing uh, a dollar or a, a rupee or a peso today and getting uh, 16 back in 30 years, that's a 10% rate of interest compounded over a 30-year period. If you, you or I were offered that investment with our own money, we would snap it up like that because it's a fantastic rate of return. So if you had one wish, which one would it be if you consider the target group? I think really the main target group is ministers of finance and ministers of planning in key countries where the burdens are very high. And when you look at the uh, budget allocations in you know, in countries like Nigeria and Ethiopia, Bangladesh, India, to nutrition, they're low. They're about 1% or 2% of government budgets. And we know that ODA just is not going to – we can't rely on ODA to reduce malnutrition. It will contribute, but it's a small contributor. And it's, if malnutrition is going to be ended in a sustainable way, it has to be on the backs of domestic resource mobilization. So I hope the report can will, – will, will give champions – uh, nutrition champions in countries, the ammunition they need to go to their ministers of finance and say, look, this is a fantastic investment. So do I understand correctly? You're saying that ODA is already quite low. And of that low ODA, only 1% is actually spent on nutrition. And therefore, it might be a good idea to spend that money on advocating with decision makers in the countries to consider spending their budgets on nutrition? To me, ODA should be being spent on helping governments to increase their allocation to, to nutrition. That might be to help them raise taxes. It might be to for matching funds. You know, we'll put in uh, four um, pesos or rupees and you put in one and maybe that, that, that ratio flips in 15 years' time. Um, maybe it's about technical support to help um, understand where the money, the government money is going and how it can be spent better. So I think there's a, there's a really important leveraging and incentivizing effect for ODA still. Less so, I think, on the delivery of big programs and more so on the catalytic, leveraging, incentivizing functions and, and also um, uh, strengthening the technical capacity of governments themselves to develop really good plans that are effectively costed, that that are going to make an impact on nutrition outcomes. What would you say to all these other NGOs that are also advocating for their issues to be promoted? I think nutrition is a, a really kind of quintessential SDG 21st century development issue. And I think that because it's got three features that I think make it such. The first feature is that it affects every country. 
I mean, it really does. It look, the, the Global Nutrition Report puts together the under and the over nutrition data. We show that one in two people on the planet is affected by malnutrition. Nearly every country is affected by malnutrition in a, in a severe way. So I think you can't say that of every other issue. The second issue about nutrition is that it's, it really is about intergenerational equity. And sustainable development is all about what do we do in this generation that enables or constrains future generations to develop. And, you know, undernutrition is all about intergenerational equity. Malnourished babies will grow up to be, are more likely to grow up to be malnourished mothers. They are more likely to give birth to malnourished babies and so on and so forth. So there's this, you know, this intergenerational cycle that we can break. And the third dimension is that it really requires collective action to deal with malnutrition. At the national level, so governments can't do it themselves, it's got to be NGOs, private sector, um, research institutes, uh, development partners, but it's also got to be lots of different sectors, so agriculture, education, social protection, water and sanitation, and even in, you know, between countries, collective action between countries, because if, if you think of uh, sustainable diets, we want sustainable diets because they, we want healthy sustainable diets because we want the food system to deliver healthier choices and healthier diets. In the report, we say the health system at the moment, we think, just serves about half the planet quite well. The other half, it completely disregards. But also, you know, you want a sustainable uh, food system as well, one that's not, not going to have such a big high carbon footprint. So you need collective action to, to figure out how do you set up incentives, you know, carrots and sticks to make the global food system deliver um, lower carbon footprints and healthier choices to people. Most malnourished people nowadays live in emerging economies, in underdeveloped regions of those countries. So it seems as if it's all about the political economy in those countries, about certain interests at work. Can a global report of the magnitude like the Global Nutrition Report actually help pressurizing local elites to let those resources flow from the richer parts to the poorer parts? You know, our report is just, it's, it's more than a report. We try to think of it as a process, as an intervention. The report is one outcome of the, of the process. We're trying to approach it in a very uh, evidence-based way. So we're trying to bring together just the best evidence and trying to do it in a very balanced way. If, if some evidence doesn't support a storyline, we, we, we don't discard it, we include it. Um, however, we are trying to have a very political approach to the, to the report and to the process that generates the report. And so we're trying to think very hard, how can we use this report to really guide and put pressure on different key stakeholders? So... Will we succeed? Uh, I don't know. Well, I think I see some initial pressure points being placed on key processes. Let me give you a few examples. So we said we think the SDGs need to pay much more attention to nutrition. So we've used the report to try to engage and influence key decision makers in that process, whether it's the Kenya-Ireland uh, co-chairs of the facilitation process, whether it's the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, whether it's the UN Health Envoy, whether it's um, David Miliband, who's the head of uh, International Rescue Committee, whether it's the government of Ethiopia or the government of Indonesia, we've tried to say, you know, you guys, if you want nutrition higher up in the SDGs, you need to fight for it. And we will give you the ammunition and we'll urge you to fight for it, but you have to do it. Similarly, in India, when we launched in India, there's a new government, there's a new uh, five-year plan going to be put into place. Uh, a new national mission on nutrition. We're trying to influence the national mission on nutrition by getting these, these numbers. I mean, the, the benefit cost ratio number for India is in the 30s or 40s. And so we've, we worked with a, a former cabinet minister to get that number into the process for the sustainable, uh, for the uh, nutrition mission. And so on and so forth. I can keep going. Indonesia, mm -hmm. the Indonesian government was shocked that they were one of 17 countries that have under five stunting, under five overweight, and under five, um, wasting. They were only one of 17 countries. And um, again, the Minister of Health, the Ministry of Health at this public meeting with 300 people said, this is a catastrophe. This is a disaster for us. And I think it was a bit of a wake-up call. So I, I, we very much, you know, we're, we're researchers, but we're also activist researchers. We, we believe in doing very dispassionate research, 
but very passionate advocacy of, the, of what the data say. I wanted to look at uh, stunting a little bit more. And there was one aspect that uh, came to my mind after I spoke to Tom Arnold about two weeks ago, when he mentioned stunting levels of 40 to 50% in some countries. I was wondering, what does that actually mean if half of the population is actually stunted? It's surely not only a human rights issue and an issue of personal health. There must be consequences. Um, does it mean that half of the population has problems getting engineering degrees and is uh, smaller than they could be? Stunting is a really technical term and we need to think of a better way of describing it because people just don't really understand what that means. And if they do understand it, they say, well, so what? I'm short. So, so what's the problem? I'm not, I'm not an idiot. I'm, I'm bright. I'm, look, I'm successful. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to say it's not about individuals being short. It's about a whole population. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's not about height per se, unless you want to be a basketball player as a professional. Uh, there's no particular return to height. It's that height is a marker for things that we really do care about. The development of the immune system, the development of the brain. I mean, the brain almost triples in weight in the first year of life. So of course, if we don't if we don't intervene in that first year or two of life, we're 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 damaging brain development. So it's a it's not about height per se. Height is how we measure the things we really care about, which is immune system development, cognitive development, a whole series of brain functions that are being laid down in those first thousand days. That's what we care about. Now, what are the consequences of that? Well. Um, some really good studies uh, look at kids that were stunted or not stunted in the first three years, three years of life, then follow up 30 years later and say, what's happened to these kids? Uh, and they find, you know, really shocking things, controlling for everything else that we can possibly control for. They find that these kids are 33% more likely to live in poverty than the kids that weren't stunted. And these are kids from the same socioeconomic backgrounds, They're, they have the same um, the parental characteristics. It's not like the kids that were not stunted are wealthier when they're three than the kids that were stunted. They're similar backgrounds. But then you, you fast forward 30 years and you find that the kids that were not stunted are better jobs, they have better school attainments, higher wage rates, and 33% less likely to be living in poverty. So Yes. I mean, countries now in Africa and Asia are thinking about the demographic dividend, the, the time in 30 or 40 years time when the ratio of working age kids, working age people to non-working age people will be very high. And they talk about it as a demographic dividend because there'll be more people in the workforce and those people will have to support fewer, fewer young people and fewer very old people. But that will only be a dividend if those people entering the labor force Uh, were not malnourished today because if they if they enter the labor force poorly equipped because they've been malnourished they won't be able to get jobs and if they do get jobs they'll be very low paying jobs so we're trying to very much you know make this a say that economics should be a central uh, the malnutrition should be a central plank of any economic growth strategy ethiopia is just doing its new five-year growth strategy indonesia is And, and India is, and we're saying to all three countries, don't don't put malnutrition in the health section. Put it in the in the strategic, sustained economic growth section because that's where it belongs. Now, when you do that, you get criticisms from people who say, look, you know, that's just a complete cop out. People say, well, look, you're you're being completely instrumental. Um, you know, you're saying nutrition is a means to an end. Well, it's a right in and of itself, isn't it? And we say, of course, it's a right in and of itself. Of course it is. Um, and you have to view it as a right. Um, but it's also, you know, the language of rights appeals to some people you want to influence and the language of economics appeals to others. So it's, it's not an either or, you have to use both. There's also the language of accountability, which appeals to those in government that need to account for expenditure uh, on ODA and so forth. I was wondering, looking at the London 2013 conference and the ICN2 conference, there were big pledges made for nutrition, $4 billion, dollars, I believe. Then there were tracking systems dis discussed and so forth. Later on, we have journalists calling in and asking, where can I access all this information? How can I make this comparable? 
uh, to whom must I attribute the numbers and so forth? Is there going to be anything different in terms of nutrition this time around? Well, we're trying very hard to make it uh, have teeth because I think a lot of these things don't have teeth. So it's very easy for governments to go and make pledges or, or big NGOs or big UN agencies or even businesses to make pledges at the 2013 conference, indeed at the ICN2 conference, the big Rome nutrition conference from last year. What we're doing is taking every one of those statements um, and, and say, going back to each one of those um, organizations that made those statements and saying, this is what you said in 20, 2013 or this is what you said in 2014 in Rome. Tell us what you've done uh, as a result of those pledges. How, where are you? Um, we expect that everything you tell us will be in the public domain. Uh, if it's a financial commitment, we want to see the numbers. If it's a non-financial commitment, we want a story. And it's going to be a story that's going to be put out there in the public domain. So on the Global Nutrition website, there are 100 organizations that signed up and made pledges at the Nutrition for Growth event. All of their pledges are on the website. All of their responses to the pledges are, are on the website in terms of what they've done. And our assessment of whether they, their response has met their pledge is also there. We make an, an independent assessment of that. And we give the rationale for why we've made the on-course or off-course assessment. So it's all there for people to see. The, it's a little bit frustrating on the financial um, commitments because the commitments made in 2013 were to begin in 2014, but the 2014 donor numbers will only become available in 2016. So this is a real problem with the, this big time lag in the reporting system of donors. Um, there's no reason for it to take two years to report those numbers. Let's look at business here for a while. The private sector, as many NGOs call them, or governments as well, is not really as monolithic as they make out. There's a huge, diverse scene of interests all in this one notion. Some make cheap food, fast food, and others make healthy food. They don't have the same interests. Would you say that NGOs should reconsider their role a little bit here and single out certain businesses? Can the Global Nutrition Report help finding the right kind of targets to go and look for those specific, somewhat negative interests in terms of nutrition? I think what we're doing in the report is helpful because we are saying to businesses, you made these commitments at the n for g you made these commitments at the International Conference on Nutrition. Tell us what you're doing. And if you don't tell us, if you, if you don't um, respond to us, we're going to say you didn't respond. And if you did respond, we're going to say what you said. And then we're going to make this assessment about whether you're on track or off track. So I think um, a lot of the businesses were very unhappy with that in the 2014 report. And I'm quite pleased that they were unhappy because I think that means that it's, it's, it's got a few uh, teeth on it. But I, I'm very tired and um, very um, kind of discouraged by just the forget about the NGO response, just everyone's response to business in nutrition because you, there seem to be very few people in the middle. Huh? It's, either, it's either these guys are the saviors, the businesses are the saviors, or they're the devil. And there's nothing, it seems to me, to be in between. Also, the debate gets, gets collapsed very quickly into breast milk, the marketing of breast milk substitutes or the, the peddling of high sugar drinks. But there's a, there's a lot more to it. Huh? There's there is, as you said, business is already deeply involved in the nutrition of communities um, through food, but they're also heavily involved through water and sanitation. They're heavily involved through mobile phone operators. They're heavily involved through fortification. There's lots of different areas where they're involved. And the 2015 Global Nutrition Report has a, a big section on here's the landscape. Here are the possibilities. Um, what can we, what, what do we agree on as a community, if anything, and what do we definitely uh, disagree on? And how can we seize the opportunities in the consensus areas and, and try to shrink the, um, the areas where we disagree on? Ultimately, this is about governance and transparency. 
There are, uh, but it's also about ideology, and we need to try to get the ideology out of it, as far as I'm concerned. The problem with getting the ideology out of it is that there isn't much evidence. When there's not much evidence, um, ide ideology rushes in to fill the vacuum. So we need donors and research funders to step up and do more evaluations of interventions that involve private sector companies. And we need private sector companies to step up and release the data that they often claim has a commercial value and therefore they can't release it. If they want to be taken seriously, um, they have to release the data and they have to become more and more transparent. Where do you see the roles of donors right now? I believe that certain donors are much more involved with nutrition than others. I mean, the donors that, re that reported the data, their spending data to us, which was fantastic, actually, the first time ever, they reported nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive. Um, they reported that to us and to the Scaling Up Nutrition movement. So I think 13 of them did that. But I don't know how many other DAC donors there are. There are probably another 20 DAC donors that didn't uh, report on their spending on nutrition. And they could for sure increase their, their spending. I thought the 13 that did report their spending um, could do a lot more on the nutrition sensitive side of things. In other words, um, interventions and expenditures in agriculture, social protection, education, water and sanitation. That could be tweaked to be more nutrition sensitive. If they could do more of that, um, I don't think that's an unreasonable thing to ask them, the donors, to do. I think it, it's more politically difficult for them to spend more on the nutrition-specific interventions because that's within the health domain. Um, many people in development see that as a band-aid and not as fundamental, fundamentally changing the way that development can support nutrition. So, okay, let's take that. Um, I still think um, those nutrition-specific interventions need to be scaled up to 90%. But um, if that's too difficult for some donors, then it shouldn't be too difficult to make their agriculture, their water and sanitation, and their education more nutrition sensitive, to make those big resource flows work a bit harder for nutrition. And the report gives some clear examples and clear guidelines of how to do that. Now, we covered a whole range here, but I still have one more question, and it concerns the right for proper nutrition which obviously follows from the discussion about the right to food. Now we have the right to proper nutrition as a subject. Do you think that this discussion and this issue is really important in practical terms? The human rights debate and the human rights approach can quickly turn some people off because some of the advocates of it tend to get embroiled in, you know, declarations and they will, they will cite long, big, long declarations and use numbers that people, it doesn't feel real to people. The language of rights is all about accountability, it seems to me. Uh, how can people who, are, who, are, who have those rights uh, make, make claims to the duty bearers? So that's, that's about holding those duty bearers, the people who have a responsibility to, de to deliver, holding them accountable. And then the duty bearers being very transparent in, kinds of, in, the, in the response to those claims made by the, the rights holders. So I think we didn't do a very good job in the 2014 report of bringing out uh, the rights language because our accountability framework is all about rights. It's about identifying um, commitments. It's about tracking commitments. It's about assessing the commitments, and then it's about leveraging the commitments and asking people, look, you, you didn't meet your commitments. What are you going to do about it? And in the report, we talk a lot about how citizens, communities um, um, need, need to be able to hold service providers to account. They need to be able to claim their, know their rights and claim their rights and see that their rights are being protected, respected, and facilitated. And that involves from some very practical tools, community scorecards, social um, audits, uh, participatory budgeting. And we talk a lot about how those are used a lot in, in the health sector outside of nutrition, how, they, how those are used in fighting corruption, but they're not used very much in the nutrition field. So I think the language of rights is really important conceptually for nutrition. But then what are the tools that we're going to use that really brings those, those concepts to life? And we, we try to, to highlight those. But we didn't do a very good job of 
signaling to the the rights based community that we we get it uh, i think i think the things we focused on signaled that we get it but we were a little bit defensive about um, not using enough of the language and i think we will will do that next time around well it's all about money isn't it i mean the mdtf the multi donor trust fund could that maybe be reconceptualized to actually pay out against those claims i mean obviously it's that's a far stretch, but you know where I'm going. You know, I think it is about money, but I think first of all, it's about ideas and leadership. And uh, without the ideas and without the intellectual leadership and the and the political leadership, then you know, it's no point in talking about money because you might just squander it and waste it. Um, I just wrote a blog um, that I hope the World Bank will publish, which says. It's not about how much money money the World Bank spends on nutrition. It's about what the leadership of the of the World Bank says about nutrition. If the World Bank leadership is not talking about it, um, that's a problem. So, in terms of um, donor pooling of funds and a fund fund, I'm actually all for it. I, I think uh, donor pooling of funds forces donors to work together. It forces them to align behind. Um, government priorities, and I think it just makes the whole process more um, consistent with the Paris declarations that the donors are always talking about. But it's a lot of hassle for them to do that. They don't like doing it. They give up control. They give up um, the ability to, to, to demonstrate their own value added if they're putting money into a pooled fund. It's very difficult to say, we did this, we did that. So it's a, there are a lot of disadvantages and downsides to donors. But you know, one of the final messages of the report was we all need to be accountable. We can't expect others to be accountable if we're not accountable. And I think putting funding into a pooled fund uh, is a way of demonstrating that you're accountable to the governments and you're accountable to your to your taxpayers. So I, I think it's a, in principle a good idea, maybe not for all of their funds for nutrition, but certainly for a big chunk of it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much.